Say. A world that has very low levels of empathy, I think that would be a much, much darker place to live in. Say. So the word I want to talk about today is a word that is very close to my heart. And it's a word that I think about a lot as a writer, as a storyteller. And that word is empathy. The English word has connections with the ancient Greek word, and at the heart of it, there is pathos, feeling. Some might say there's maybe passion or suffering as well. But right away, I want to make a distinction between empathy and sympathy. Even though they might sound similar or they might have similar roots, I think they're completely different things. Sympathy at first glance has very positive connotations, but when you scratch the surface a little bit, underneath there is a distance, if not even a hierarchy, between the observer and the person who is being observed. So in a way you're showing pity or sympathy as if you are a little bit above that person, as if you're a bit better off and looking not down upon that person necessarily, but from a certain distance, even if with good intentions. I think empathy is a very different word than sympathy. It is much, much more complex. So the old saying, the old English saying, to walk in someone else's moccasins might be helpful in that regard. Because in order to develop empathy, we need to be able to walk in the shoes of another person for a few hours or for a few days and experience experience the world through their eyes and see how the world treats you if you were to become that person. It's almost like a cognitive journey, an intellectual journey. You might even say it's a spiritual journey, it's a humbling journey to become someone else and understand their sorrow, their joys, their story. This also has echoes with mystical philosophy. So, for instance, when you look at Buddhist teachings or old Sufi poems, there is that emphasis that there is not, there is no distance between you and I or I or and the other. And in fact, we're all interconnected. We're all connected in a much more egalitarian and circular way. And that's why I think connectivity lies at the heart of empathy, the notion that we're not that separate from each other as human beings. Another example I can share with you is by an English poet. Um, And it's a poem that goes all the way back to 17th century. It has a history of at least 400 years in which John Donne talks about how no man is an island entire of itself and every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Let's make it more gender egalitarian and let's say no human being is an island entire of itself and every human being is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. So I find that emphasis on connectivity very important. But still, I think even that is not enough to understand what exactly empathy is. In in order to add another layer, we have to take a closer look at the German definition, at the German concept of Einfühlung. And I'm sure I'm mispronouncing the word, but I still want to share it with you because I love its meaning. And it means, if you unpack the word, it means in feeling, or in other words, a feeling like a journey into someone else's existence, into the experience of the other. It is perhaps not a coincidence that the person, the German philosopher who developed this concept at the beginning of the 20th century, Theodor Lips, he was very much interested in art and aesthetics. And the original usage of the concept was very much in relation to a work of art. As the observer, you, you journey into another work, or into a work of art, and you enter into that zone. Later on, the philosopher also used it to mean putting yourself into someone else's position, but also entering their mindset. I think it's important to bear in mind that Theodor Lips had an impact on Sigmund Freud and especially on Freud's um, theory of the unconscious. But when I think about the concept more carefully, I realize the person who I think had a very bright approach to the concept of empathy for me personally was James Baldwin. 
the American author, public thinker, uh, James Baldwin, he said, you know, there are moments when, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm not exactly quoting him, but he said, there are moments when you think your pain is unique, it's unprecedented, your suffering is unprecedented in the history of the world. But then you read, you read books. And when you read books, you realize that the things that torment you most are actually also the things that connect you in a much deeper way to the rest of humankind. And I believe that connection um, through, you know, feeling other people's stories and sorrows is essential for the art of storytelling. You might also say the poet Walt Whitman even took it a further, a step further. He said, when I see a wounded person, let's say on the street, I do not ask that person how they feel. I become the wounded person. For me, that's very interesting because when you're writing a novel, you have to become that person. Even if the characters you're writing about might not be very positive at first glance. But I don't think it's only writers that make those journeys of empathy. Readers also make those journeys. I have many readers um, in Turkey and in different countries who might come from more conservative backgrounds. And if you ask their opinions about minorities, for instance, about Armenians, Greeks, Jews, Alevis, Kurds, because these are the main minorities in Turkey, they might tell you lots of stereotypes and pejorative cliches, you know, because this is the only thing that they have heard in their home, in their neighborhood. Equally, I have many readers who, who are homophobic or transphobic because this is the only narrative they have heard around them. This is, you know, what they were brought up with. But then the same people sometimes come and they say, you know, I read your book. And the character that I loved the most, that I associated with, you know, identified with the most, was this person. And maybe the character they're talking about is Armenian, or Jewish, or Greek, or gay, or bi, or trans. So I thought about this a lot. How is it possible that people who in their daily lives, who are more judgmental, you know, ready to separate themselves from the so-called other, the same people, when they're reading a work of art, when they're reading a story, a novel, when they retreat into the inner space, the inner garden, they become a little bit more ready to connect with the other, both in their heart and through their mind. So I think art, storytelling, literature is very much rebellion, you know, against apathy. And I want to emphasize that word because all emotions might have sometimes their difficulties. But if there's one emotion that worries me and frightens me, that is apathy, the lack of all emotions. It is numbness. It is the moment when we become indifferent, desensitized, disconnected, when we stop caring about each other's stories. So all I can say is a person who has very low capacity for empathy, I think would have problems in understanding what other people are going through, but also imagine a world that has very low levels of empathy. I think that would be a much, much darker place to live in. Say, Say.